Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I am the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. If you are watching this interview on YouTube, a comment would be great. And if you are listening to the podcast, a review would be great. Today, my guest is Jessica Hudak. The guests I typically interview have a technical background, and Jessica is no exception. Uh, she's also an attorney, so how does technical and attorney go together? So let's let's get into that. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Jessica. Thank you so much, Neil, for having me. So from the research I did on you, Jessica, I saw that you got a degree in mechanical engineering. What was the What was the motivation to get that degree? Um, yeah, thanks for asking. You know, when I was in high school and thinking about what I wanted to do as a career, I didn't really even know too much about engineering. My family had actually all been um, artists and we had, you know, one lawyer in the family, but no engineers. Um, but I really loved math to the point where I would do my math homework ahead of time just for fun. Um, so I'm a total geek. So I fit your podcast perfectly. Um, but I luckily had some math teachers that really encouraged me to think about engineering. And I'm so glad that I followed their advice and applied to a few different engineering schools across the country. Um, and then mechanical really appealed to me because it seemed it just was like, you know, things you can touch and feel right. Like you can see it happening in the world around you and understanding the physics and how things work together and, and how to make things work. Um, really appealed to me and, and pulled me in. Um, so that's why I selected mechanical engineering. Wow. So you used to do your math homework in advance. Maybe you should be the host of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I did the math homework, but certainly not in advance. Eh? That, that, was a last, <laughs> that was a last minute job, I'll tell you. <laughs> that's wonderful. All right. So you get, a, you get an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, but you weren't done with school yet. You got a, a, a master's in biomechanical engineering. So what was the motivation for that? Yeah, absolutely. So I was really lucky in that um, I had the opportunity to do a few different internships while I was getting my undergraduate degree. Um, and I did one um, at a kind of a big jet engine manufacturer, and I did one at a medical device company. And I was so inspired by the patient-focused mission and that I was working on things that would ultimately save lives. I just loved that. And I feel like the people who walked around the building had that same just excitement and passion for what they were doing. And so really wanted to head down that path. And I loved school so much, um, I wasn't ready to leave yet, and so decided to apply um, to become a biomechanical engineer. Um, and luckily, Stanford decided to take a chance on me. Um, and so the, the second I got that acceptance letter, I was ready to go and, and out the door. Nice. Did you ever consider doing a PhD? You know, I... Not really, actually. A lot of my colleagues uh, or fellow students, rather, who were getting their master's with me were all on the PhD track. But really, I wanted to get into industry um, and start working at companies and making devices. And um, and so really was was just drawn to industry and, and didn't really think about academia. I, I did think about it later, actually, once I became a lawyer, but that's a that's a future story. <laughs> yeah, okay. So now you got these a couple of, of engineering degrees. What type of work did you what what type of work did you do? Yeah, so I um a couple things. So I while I was at University of Michigan, I met a patent attorney there. He taught uh you know patents 101 to uh engineering students took his class and loved it. And he actually offered me a part-time job. So while I was studying um, biomechanical engineering, I was also working as a patent engineer and loved that. And so when I uh, left grad school as an engineer, I actually knew I wanted to go into patent law at that point. What I loved about patent law was that it really kept me at the very beginnings of the innovation cycle. I got to see groundbreaking innovations, um, and I kind of stayed at that early stage. You know, it didn't turn into the iterative design um, or improvements that, you know, later more established products are, you know, uh, take part in. And so love that. And so I was able to use my technical background and my love for writing and merge them in that way. Um, and so I worked at a small law firm that only worked with medical device companies. And then I ultimately moved in-house and worked with a medical device startup company. So I got to stay really close to medical devices that I loved, but then work as a patent engineer. 
Um, and actually, my once my boss found out at the medical device startup that I was also an engineer and had interest in, in kind of keeping those skills fresh, he brought me in on some of our skunk work projects. So I got to work as an engineer um, during that time as well. Oh, wow. That's great. But then you you mentioned it. You already kind of teased it. You decided to go back to school. A couple of engineering degrees wasn't enough. You decided to go to <laughs> law school. So what was the motivation to go to law school? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I took the LSAT, which is the test you have to take to get into law school right after graduate school as I was leaving. But I thought, you know what, I've been in school for a long time. I want to get out into the real world. I want to see what this is all about. So I decided to put law school on hold for a while. And I wanted to make sure that I really loved patent law, that I didn't want to you know, go back to engineering or, or business or something like that. Um, and so worked for a few years as a patent agent. I took the patent bar, which is a special exam so that engineers can actually prosecute patents with the United States Patent Office. And so work, did that work and really loved it. And so I was like, okay, it, I really do love this. And I was kind of feeling like I was reaching a point in my career where without the law degree, I would be limited in the type of work that I wanted to do. And so really what pushed me ultimately to go to law school when I did was that my LSAT scores were gonna expire. So I was like, all right, it's now or never. Um, so I applied for law schools and started, started to go. Um, but I promised myself at that point, because I, you know, I'd worked as a patent agent, by that time I, I had actually started my own um, consulting firm with myself and a few other patent agents. And we served as in-house, part-time in-house counsel for medical device startup companies. Um, and so was loving my job, loving my career. And so I promised myself, if I don't love law school, I don't have to stay. You know, I wasn't someone who, uh, people call them kindergarten through JD, who just go all the way straight through. I wasn't someone still trying to find myself. I'd had a career. I knew what I wanted to do. So I wasn't going to force myself through law school. But as it turned out, once I arrived, I just absolutely fell in love with it. Um, I love the reasoning, the logic, the, the, we get to read all the time, a lot of writing. Um, and it, like kind of working as a patent agent had done, it really melded my world of interest. And so was so glad that I had, um, chosen to go to law school and, and end up there. And it really expanded my world again, exposing me to all different areas of law, um, which I really loved. Nice. So now you're an attorney. You've got a couple of engineering degrees. You took the LSAT. You worked for a while. You got you went to law school. You're an attorney now. What type of work do you do as an attorney? So I, um, after law school, um, what's interesting about law school is it's actually very litigation focused, meaning if you envision the trial lawyers who are arguing in front of a judge and a jury, that's litigation. And so it's very litigation focused. The transactional work, like writing patents or writing contracts, you get exposure to that. But the way they teach law is really much more litigation focused. And so I, I was so glad I had that opportunity and really fell in love with litigation. And so I knew I wanted to head down that path. I'd done patent prosecution for you know, almost 15 years at this point. So I was ready to try litigation and kind of bring that um, experience into my uh, background. And so I... Uh, work I just I applied for and um, got a clerkship and so I was a clerk to the chief judge of the federal circuit so the court of appeals of the federal circuit which is the court in Washington DC that hears all of the patent appeals um, unlike other areas of law that really just kind of go up geographically based on where you filed uh, the initial complaint patent cases are all funneled to this one national court um, called the F federal circuit and so it was perfect for me. So I got to see a ton of patent cases there. Um, I learned how to become a better researcher. I learned how to draft legal opinions and write briefs. So it was just an incredible experience. Um, and the judge I clerked for was just absolutely wonderful and an incredible mentor. I learned so much from her about how to be a good lawyer and really how to be a good person. Um, and so after I finished up my clerkship, I wanted to stay on the litigation path. And so I, I joined a law firm and at the law firm, I was doing litigation and ultimately drawn towards appellate litigation, which means you're arguing cases in front of courts of appeals or the Supreme Court. And so um, did a lot of patent appeals there, I had the opportunity to actually work on a case, be part of a team, a patent case that was before the Supreme Court. So kind of, you know, at least my as a lawyer dream come true, getting to work in that 
at that level with those lawyers and, you know, those justices. Um, and so then once I, I did that for about four or five years, six, if you count the clerkship, and then I was really missing medical devices and I wanted to get back into that industry. And so that's when I started to look at getting back in house. And that's what landed me up at my current company. And to answer your initial question, the work I'm currently doing right now is more of a general counsel type role. So I'm the division general counsel for one of our business units. Um, and it actually is our advanced technology division, which is perfect for me because it is, it's essentially the skunk works of our company. It's what is the next thing going to be? What is, how do we build our pipeline and put new products and get us ready to continue to grow and expand? Um, so it really allows me to fall back on my IP expertise, but also get exposed to, you know, broader areas of law and really um, business and strategy and partnering with executives on, you know, driving strategy and um, and really running a business. So it's oh, been great. Wonderful. That's excellent. I, I, you're, you're right. I asked you one question. You gave me a little bit more. What's the problem? <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> wonderful. You know, Jessica, when you were talking, it made me, Think about what I said earlier when I was introducing you. What could this tie between, you know, typically when you talk about attorneys, you're not thinking about engineering, but I actually know quite a number of engineers who went on to be patent attorneys. But so I'm really curious, how did your engineering, I guess your your engineering background, how did it prepare you for work in law? Yeah, absolutely. So I think really what it gave me was just a comfort level with technology and a comfort level with learning new things and quickly getting up to speed on new technologies. And as a patent attorney, because you're seeing new technology every day and you really need to become an expert very quickly so that you can write a good patent or litigate patents and understand the technology. Um, so that it gave me a comfort level with that. And um, almost being able to speak that language, right? Like understanding technical language and um, and kind of building that comfort level. And I would say to um, having had the background in medical devices, especially now as I'm at a medical device company, but even when I was litigating life science patents, again, you know, having that experience, understanding what these companies go through to bring these um, you know medicines or devices to market really helps me understand the business better because ultimately that's what lawyers are doing, right? We're, we're advising and um, guiding business partners so that they can understand the risk and then make the right decision for their business. Another thing that I was thinking about, or thinking about when you were talking, Jessica, you mentioned it in passing is that at one point you ran your own consulting firm with a bunch of other patent agents advising medical device companies. So mm -hmm. you were the boss. And now you work for a company. What was that transition yeah. like? Yeah, you know, the hardest transition was actually from running my own business to being a associate at a law firm um, because I actually ran the business all the way through law school and then sold it when I graduated so that I could work for the government and clerk um, and then came to a law firm. And what's interesting about law firms is they are very they're very hierarchical. They want to know when you graduated and that's kind of where they, whatever law year you graduated, they kind of put you in that place in the law firm. Um, and so it was almost as though my, you know, 15, 17 years of experience prior didn't count. Um, obviously I was, because I had this experience, I was able to do great work. I was on excellent cases, you know, worked with wonderful partners. And so it's not like it was ignored, but it really wasn't going to advance my career as quickly as I wanted or in a way I wanted. And so what was great about coming back in house was they really valued that first you know, 17 years of experience um, and brought me back in at a leadership level. So I'm on the leadership team for both of our law department and the business unit that I'm the general counsel for. Um, but, you know, it while there were certain challenges and, um, you know, I was often as old or older than the partners I was working for at the law firm, it was such an incredible experience. <laughs> and I knew that I needed this experience as part of, you know, to be a really great lawyer, I wanted this litigation experience. And I knew I didn't know it, right? And so it was, I wanted to be humble and I wanted to learn. And I'm so glad I did because I learned so much more than if I had just come in and said, well, I was the boss before, so I'm going to be the boss here. Um, it really wouldn't have served me. So I'm so glad that I, you know, took those years to learn this new skill 
um, and then I've been able to apply it going forward. That's wonderful that you had that humility to listen to people who were younger than you, even though you had 15 years, you know, 15 plus years of, of prior experience that really didn't count for much, apparently, at the law firm. You're better than me. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a problem. <laughs> That's wonderful. You mentioned that you're now on uh, where you are, you're on the leadership team. If you were to offer uh, one tip on on leadership, what would it be? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think the one tip would be reading the room. Um, and I think, and this kind of ties into the topic of your podcast is how to effectively communicate with others. And I think it's really important to understand the folks around you, what's the mood in the room, and then gearing, kind of setting your tone and, and maybe the level of detail you're going to go into or the points you're going to try and get across. Um, setting them to the room. And that applies whether you're interacting with C-level executives or members of your team that you're mentoring and guiding. Um, and so I think that would be my my piece of advice. Nice. Yes, that's a, that's a good piece of advice. And it actually leads very nicely to my next question. You did mention it. This podcast generally is about the, the public speaking journeys of those with technical backgrounds. And it really started based on on my own struggles, having to give presentations in front of management when I worked as an engineer and not being all that great at it. But I got a lot better at it over time because I saw the benefit of it. Were you always good at, at speaking in front of others? And, and if not, what did you do to get better at it? You know, I was always OK at it, I would say. Um, and but there's you know always ways to get better. I mean, still to this day, I get very nervous before I speak, which I've actually just accepted as that's okay, right? That like keeps me sharp, it keeps me on my toes, and make sure I prepare. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah. So, um, sorry, my headphone cut out. I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, and so, how did I get better at it? Um, really, it's just practicing a lot, putting yourself out there and taking those opportunities to do it because you're not going to get better at it unless you do it. Um, and then also listening to people who are better at it than I am and asking them for their advice. I have uh, worked with a lot of coaches. I've just talked to colleagues that I really respect the way they speak and ask how they think about things and then incorporate uh, you know, what I think might work for me into my practice. But I'm very conscious. I don't just stand up and talk. I prepare. I think about my audience. What are they going to want to know? And so it's very, um, it doesn't just happen, right? I plan ahead and I think about how I'm going to present things. And I think that helps build a comfort level and a confidence uh, because I, you know, some people can wing it and sound amazing, but that's, that's just not me. You know, I know I have to kind of prepare and plan how I'm going to talk about something. I don't think most people who think they're good at winging it are actually good at winging it. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> I, I have a friend and he gives me a hard time over the fact that I prepare my presentations as well. I'm with you 100%. And the reason I'm a firm believer in preparing is that you get to, as you mentioned, you get to think about how are you going to put this presentation together? What makes sense to say first, second, third? I mean, you get to think about all that before you actually give the presentation. When you yeah. do it just on the spot, you know, winging it, it just comes out as it comes out. And especially if you're speaking on something that's technical, that's not a good idea because especially if you're speaking in front of a non-technical audience, you really want to make it as clear as possible. They're already mm -hmm. probably annoyed that they have to sit through this pre presentation in the first <laughs> place. So just do them a favor and, and make it more likely that they actually listen as opposed to play on their phones or fall asleep. Yes, exactly right. <laughs> you exactly. certainly don't want to hear people snoring. That, that's <laughs> what, I'll kill your right. vibe. Things are not going like, well if you've got snores in the room. So when it comes to the preparation you do, do you have a process for putting your prep or your presentations together? And if so, what is it? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I do is really try to figure out why am I giving this presentation? What is the purpose of it? Sometimes it might be to uh, just update the group on something. Sometimes it might be to we have to the group has to reach a decision about something, um, or it might be you know here's a problem I've looked into and here's my recommendation for how we move forward. So it's really important for me to before I even start anything like what's my purpose. <clears throat> And then the second thing I think about is, okay, who's my audience? And what are they really going to care about? 
If you're talking to C-level executives, they don't want you to drone on for 10 minutes. They don't have that much time. They want you to get to the point, tell them what they need to know that, so that they can make the decision and then move on. But if you're updating a technical group, for example, or your team, and you need to get everyone on the same page, you might need to provide more detail at that point. And so it's really important to kind of know the audience, know what they're gonna care about. And then I start structuring the presentation accordingly. I will always put the most important stuff up front and then I explain it later. That kind of, that brings people in, it lets them know why they're there, it let them know why they need to listen to you. And then, um, and it, while they're listening to the rest of the presentation, for example, if you've asked them, okay, we need to either go with A or B, and you tell them that front, as they're listening to the presentation, they're thinking, okay, do I want A or B based on what I'm hearing here? Um, and then, and then I will also decide on how much detail, as I mentioned earlier, how much detail I include. I often include as little detail as possible. I want to know the detail. I want to have done all the work and know the information inside out so that I can answer any questions. But I don't want to provide too much detail because that's when you lose people. That's when they start looking at their phones. And so I try to keep it as simple as possible and then maybe have backup slides if people have questions or just be prepared to answer questions as they come up. I do, however, want to anticipate questions that will come and make sure I have prepared material and slides on that. Um, and then also, like I said earlier, reading the room. Um, once you get in there, I guess I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I'll just say if you start losing people, if they're looking at their phone, that's when I'll either change the subject, ask, some, ask someone in the audience a question, move along. And so it's really important to, to you know, keep people engaged as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because when you say ask somebody a question, you usually ask somebody a question while they're looking at their phone. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they got no idea what's going on. I'm like, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> you oh, might not want to do that to the CEO. Maybe not, but yeah. you know, there's other people. You can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. You you leave that person alone. But uh, yeah. anybody else a fair game? Damn it. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly. You know, you mentioned earlier that every now and then you get nervous before a presentation. What do you do to manage your nerves? Yeah, absolutely. So I make sure I prepare. And so that helps me. I can kind of talk myself off the ledge, like, so you know this, you're ready, you're ready to go in there. Um, but then also, and I don't remember where I learned it, but I, I heard a woman, a woman speaker who I really respected say, excitement, or excuse me, nerves, you know, nervousness is really close to excitement in your, you know, the way your body feels it. And so you just have to trick your brain that you're not nervous, you're excited. And so I actually do that. I'll actually say, oh my gosh, this is so exciting that I get this opportunity. It's going to go so well. And so I kind of give myself this little pep talk. And then the other piece of advice I heard is if you stand up with your shoulders out, hands on your hips, we call it superwoman pose or superman pose. It actually brings an energy to your body. And there's actually research that shows that this works. And so I'll do that too. And so really just kind of psyching myself up. Um, and so it helps. And then I always have nerves at the beginning. I can hear my voice waver or I talk too fast. So the other piece of advice I got there was memorize your first two sentences. So you're not leaving anything to chance so that you come out, you know, exactly what you're going to say. And then you can go more into the casual, you know, walking through the presentation at that point. Um, but yeah, so that, that's how I do it. But really the fundamental important part is preparation because then you can convince yourself that it's going to go okay and, and you, you're going to do well. With that superwoman pose, I'm assuming you're doing that before the presentation and not during it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, find a quiet room or even just subtly do it while I'm waiting to walk on stage or, you know, into the conference. You know, what's trickier is when you go, you know, third or fourth in a, you know, hour and a half long meeting. And so I, I get myself psyched up before I walk in the room. Um, and that usually once I get started, the nerves kind of ease away as I get going. Yeah, I can just, I'm just, I'm just imagining somebody giving a presentation, shaking uncontrollably and sweating out of every orifice of their body thinking, I'm excited. This isn't nerve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's sometimes harder to convince your brain, but it, you know, it's you know, you just have to keep, you know, stop telling yourself that. <laughs> 100%. So for the people who are watching or listening to our conversation, Jessica, and they want to get better or more effective at giving presentations or public speaking generally, what's the number one tip you could offer them? Yeah, just do it. 
get out there and do it. And um, I also, once I've given a presentation, I will take the time after to reflect on what went well and what didn't so that I can hone it for the next time. And I really view it, every opportunity is an opportunity to get better. And so you prepare before, you do it, and you kind of have a postmortem after, what did I like, what didn't I like? And then make sure you bring that into the next one. And so I would view it, um, just it's always a learning opportunity. And you're never going to get perfect. You can always get better. Um, and so really viewing it in that lens um, that you're, you're a student, you're learning here, um, I think helps kind of helps you get better along the process. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, it, it really is a, a destination that you never really get to, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, and, and you can read all the books and, and listen to all the podcasts like this one, but you don't get better at it unless you actually get out there and do it. So yeah, I, I, yep. I fully agree with you. And, and I've seen the benefit even in myself and the people that I know who have gotten better at, at giving presentations and public speaking generally and what's done for them in their lives and, and in their jobs. Because typically, you know, those people that move up in companies, those are the ones who are good at, at speaking. I mean, you that's know, absolutely right. Yes. If yep. you want to be that engineer that sits at their desk and thinks that everyone's going to notice you and, and the great work that you do, you have another thing coming. <laughs> yep. That's right. I agree. Yeah. And then you're going to be that same engineer complaining because someone else got the, the promotion and the pay raise that you thought it, that that should have been yours, but they were just better at, at speaking to the people who could make those decisions. And, and that's how that happens. Yep, absolutely. This has been a great conversation, Jessica. Thank you so much for being a guest. How can people get in touch with you? Absolutely. So I am on LinkedIn. Uh, so Jessica Hudak. So feel free to reach out with me there. Um, and I'd be always happy to talk with folks. It's, I love mentoring engineers and young lawyers. So please do reach out. Um, I'd really love to speak with you. And Neil, you feel free to put my LinkedIn link um, in the notes or, or however. Um, I'm always happy to connect. Wonderful that you that you offered to for me to provide that LinkedIn link. I was going to do it anyway, but thank you for, for, <laughs> for, for, for offering it, Eddie. <laughs> Wonderful. Good. <laughs> I'd ask for no damn permission. <laughs> well, everyone, this, this marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. I work for technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Thanks. And thanks for being here, Jessica. Thank you so much, Neil. It's been a pleasure. Take care.